This is breaking news. Housing um, those who are our brothers and sisters who have fallen on hard times. Uh, uh, the other night, I think it was Thursday night, uh, while out, uh, must have been about 1.30 in the morning, while out uh, looking at our subways uh, on Flatbush and, and Decab Avenue, uh, there was a, an encampment where a woman was living and I got out the car and uh, sat down next to her, engaged in the conversation. And it was clear uh, that um, she needed uh, real mental health support. And she did not want to be there. She didn't trust in the system. Uh, she stated that, you know, to have the mayor of the city of New York sit down and talk with her uh, to show real concern. Uh, it was important that uh, we at least engage her in a real way and let her know what her, her options were. And she is symbolic of what I see all the time as I move around the city and stop and talk with uh, those who are living on the streets. And oftentimes, uh, if you don't speak one-on-one -on -one with them on the ground, you're not going to resolve this on the ground. Uh, you can't resolve it just by being here in the sterilized environment of City Hall and think that's the answer. And no, it's not. Uh, that is why um, I am talking to uh, those who are uh, homeless uh, at 2, 3 in the morning. That's why we're doing the end of the line program. Uh, when you look at the numbers, that first week, uh, I believe we only had 22 people we talked um, to go into shelter. But after building trust, we're now up to 700 people. 700 people we were walking by every day in our city took us up on the offer of looking at the brochures that we've, we, we're showing them, showing what the shelter system is looking, looking like, having Gary out there, uh, seeing him out there 2, 3 in the morning uh, talking to people, being at the end of the line of 5, 6 a.m. in the morning, on the ground talking to people, trying to resolve this issue. So it's easy to sit back and say, there's some miracle that's going to change this. No, this is consistent, hard work, and we are willing to do it. We're willing to roll up our sleeves and get this done, and we're asking everyone to join us. In a few weeks, we're going to be announcing an initiative with uh, Norman Siegel that's going to involve hundreds of volunteers. Uh, we are going to meet people where they are, and we're going to build trust. You can't do this without trust. It can't happen, and that is what we're doing. That's why we went from 22 to 700 people. That number should resonate. Those who said we couldn't do it, it's not possible. We're proving them wrong every day, and we continue to use a term that has become connected to our administration, historic. What we are announcing today is the largest investment in the city's history in support of vulnerable New Yorkers experiencing homelessness on our streets and subway. The largest investment in city's history. We say that over and over again, <laughs> over and over again. Come on. Come on. You know? And for some reason, that historic part never makes it into the story. <laughs> you know? uh, but we're going to continue to do it. $171 million a year beginning in fiscal year 2023. Now, this is not a one and done. This is baseline that every year this is going to happen. The funding will include expanding outreach efforts and connect those in need to special, specialized resources. We didn't discover this on our own. We spoke to the advocates. We spoke with Sham. We spoke with those. We had a meeting last week, mm -hmm. first time, where homeless and formerly homeless people sat down with our chief housing officer to give us the ideas as we continue to expand on what we are attempting to accomplish. This funding will help expand these efforts, including safe havens, stabilization beds, and drop-off centers, the things that people have stated constantly 
these are the things you, you, need to, you need to do. So now here's the partnership. Every elected official, every advocate that states we want these types of beds, we're saying to them, join us. Mm -hmm. You know, join us. We're not going to oversaturate one community with, with, with the beds that we're looking for, because we have done that historically. Mm -hmm. We're not going to do that. This is a New York City's problem. So the New York City must ensure that this has happened happen correctly. And so we're making sure that we have safe spaces for New Yorkers to live, to heal, to heal, and to be cared for. The investment will help fund 1,400 non uh, low barrier haven and st stabilization beds, uh, bringing the total up to 4,000. Now, previous administration, talked about these beds, we are funding these beds, which is a big difference. It's a difference between articulating on the needs of people and then allocating the money to give the items that are needed for people, and that's what we're doing. 4,000 beds, and this is how we help people get second chances. And we know what happened during the pandemic. People were traumatized. They lost their jobs. They're dealing with mental health illnesses and issues. Uh, we need to create a wellness embrace city where we embrace the totality of wellness for all New Yorkers and that is what we're going to do. The pandemic aggravated these mental health issues, the medical issues. That woman that I communicated with last week should not wait until her chronic disease reach, reaches a crisis moment to fill our emergency rooms. We need to be there for her prior to that to give her the wraparound services she de deserves. And for too long, we have not done that. Government has abandoned them, and we know it's wrong to do so, and we're going to move it in the right direction. We're not abandoning our homelessness, our homeless family members and loved ones, and we are proud of this historic uh, allocations of resources of stating that we're going to show our support for those who are in need. And I want to thank my colleagues who are here because they have been advocating for this for so long. Uh, Gail Brewer, during my days, and uh, we were borough presidents together, she talked about this. Julie Menon and how she has leaned into, uh, Councilman Maiella and how she has leaned into to this. These are our partners, and we're proud to have them here today. I heard you. We're allocating the dollars to get this done correctly, and this is only the beginning. There's so much more we're going to do and cons consistently do. We're not going to just leave people living in the state that they have been living in for so long. It's imperative for us to take action. We're taking action, and we are allocating the resources with it as well. I thank you so much, um, Deputy Mayor William Issa, and trust me when I tell you, your pastor is saying amen right now. <laughs> Amen. 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 Oh, that's a good one. All right, now I'd like to bring up my sister Jessica Katz, our Chief Housing Officer. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Williams Isom, and thank you, Mayor Adams, for your commitment to new and better solutions for our housing needs. This is a critical investment that will get us closer to the end goal permanent housing. All too often, we talk about homelessness and our housing issues as though they are separate. I want to be clear that homelessness is a housing issue, which is why I am here today. We cannot solve the homelessness crisis if we do not have places where people are safe and supported. If someone wants help but is struggling with addiction or mental health issues, we need to make it easier to get services, not harder. For too long, we've required people to jump through hoop after hoop, which often means that those who need the support the most fall through the gaps. Today's announcement is the type of progress we need to stop this. I want to thank the elected officials who are here today, sincerely, um, the, who, the ones who are here and many others across the city who understand it to their core that the New Yorkers who are experiencing homelessness are just as much their constituents as anyone else and who are standing by us here today. I also want to thank those with us today who have experienced homelessness for coming and sharing your stories. You know better than anyone what the issues are and how we can do better. And I'm so grateful for your partnership, yes. because having those who have faced homelessness at the table means we aren't talking about the people we need to serve, but having a conversation with them. Come on. This will only make us better prepared to help New Yorkers who are still facing this crisis. Mr. Mayor, thank you again for your commitment to this issue. This is a truly important moment. Thank you. 
For many of us in this administration, this is not just a job. For many of us, this is our life's work. With that, I'd like to bring up someone who this is his life work and who takes this issue in particular very seriously, the Commissioner for the Department of Social Services, Mr. Gary Jenkins. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. <clears throat> Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for your vision and your leadership. Um, as stated, I'm Commissioner Gary Jenkins from the Department of Social Services, and it is so wonderful to be here today. Today is a good day yes. because today we get to announce the largest investment made by any administration to street outreach and targeted low barrier programs. This investment is going to help support some of our most vulnerable New Yorkers experiencing homelessness on the streets and subways and will provide them necessary shelter and services. Having personally spent time growing up in our shelter system, I know how critical it is that we invest in our bed capacity so that we can assure New Yorkers that there is a warm place to rest their head if they are experiencing unsheltered homelessness. And I am so excited to bring these resources to our five boroughs. Today, we get to help our most vulnerable New Yorkers. Today, we are coming together as a community. And today, we are delivering an investment in their future, our future. My agency is on hand to help in any capacity to ensure that all New Yorkers are being assisted and supported. And I want to take the opportunity to thank all of the elected officials, especially the ones here today. Um, I'm looking forward to working with you and being a partner as we address homelessness in New York City. Thank you. As the mayor said last week, we had a meeting with um, a group of people who had lived experience. Sham Zabarin was one of those people, and um, all of us in the administration sort of stood to the side, and the folks were at the table. It was a profound moment, it was a beautiful moment, but it was also a moment where I think we all learned. Everyone looked different. It was men, it was women, it was young people. They were black, they were white, they were Latin, no, Latinos. And so we really have learned so much and are so appreciative of Shams DeBaron for continuing to teach us, because Lord knows we need to learn a lot. But thank you so much for being here with us today, Shams, and for your partnership. Yeah, yeah, I'm not that tall, you know. <laughs> okay. Now I lost the teeth, so, you know, we're working it out. <laughs> uh, so let me say this. Um, first of all, uh, for my, uh, uh, my brothers and sisters that have experienced homelessness or are experiencing homelessness, I do want to say that uh, it's such an honor that, um, it's beyond an honor, the fact that this administration has given us what the mayor promised when he was a candidate, mm -hmm. a seat at the table. Mm -hmm. And it's not just, this ain't for photo ops or nothing like that. This is real. Mm -hmm. Like, homeless New Yorkers from different parts of the city uh, came to City Hall and really contributed to what will become the housing plan for this administration, and that's historic. That's never happened, ever. And so we need to embrace that moment in history. We need to understand our power. Not too long ago, I was on a park bench. Not too long ago, I was riding those subways. And to be able to stand with, the, with an administration that's committed to homelessness, and we're not even, what, four months in? <laughs> we're not even four months in. People were, were asking, what is he going to do? What, what, you know, not even four months in, and what, we got 171 million? <laughs> not, not for what you think. But for what the people ask for. There you go. There you go. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta embrace that. So I, not, pardon me. I know I got time. <laughs> so I want to say greetings to everybody. Uh, what a joyful day this is. I'm proud to be here with my mayor. I, I mean our mayor, <laughs> the deputy name, deputy mayor, Ann Williams Isom, Commissioner Gary Jenkins, and. The Chief Housing Officer Jessica Katz, uh, my City Council people, 
My brother Eddie Gibbs. Eddie, Eddie grew up with me, so you know, that's good buddy back there. And my name is Shams the Baron. I grew up in foster care since the age of two. At the age of 10, I started experiencing homelessness. And at 12, I was discharged permanently into the streets. My story ain't all gloom and doom, for I was an academic star and a pioneer of hip hop. But the experience of being homeless has been a constant factor in my life. I was that person that you see in the street and subway. I had nowhere to go. I did seek help, but help for me was hard to find. And I saw myself descend further into a place of disconnect. I felt the so-called system had failed me in their duty to protect and care for me as a child. And, and it created problems for me as I grew up into adulthood. I grew to distrust the system like so many of my peers do. Yet today I'm proud to say it ain't gonna be like that no more. Not for me and not for my brothers and sisters who are living in the streets. I said this before and I'll say it again. I'm not fighting for my brothers and sisters to be in the streets, to be on the subways, or to be in the encampments. I'm fighting for them to be treated with dignity, respect, care, and compassion. I'm fighting to get them housed. But on that journey to housing, they'll have a better option than those congregate settings. I'm being nice today. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they'll engage with trusted people and be provided safe haven and stabilization beds with medical and mental health services. I'm here with the mayor and his administration applauding this historic funding, which brings the total number of these important beds and resources to over 4,000. That is a huge investment that means more people will be on the path to stability, stability. And what I didn't know, Brother Mayor, is that this is every year? That's right, Brother. <laughs> oh, now we're talking. Now we're talking. We need the support of all levels of government from the federal, state, and the city. Right. We need that city council, too. Right. We got hotels. We got to get them. Right. Mm -hmm. We got to change some of these zoning laws. We got to work with the state to state change some of these things. And our neighbors and residents throughout the city, you have to understand, being homeless doesn't make you a criminal. That's right. Right. We are human beings, <laughs> and if we're giving the proper access to services, then we can thrive in any community. I'm a testament to that. So I want to say that we're in crisis right now. Let's be clear. This is a crisis. I give our mayor props for addressing this crisis, which is decades mm -hmm. in the making. Mm -hmm. Mm. Ending homelessness in New York City is not going to happen overnight. But I believe that if we all work together, rich, poor, black, white, I don't care what you identify as, if we all work together and help this administration, we will end homelessness. Like the mayor said, the end goal is housing. And I know we will get there. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Ooh, we're getting the word this morning for sure. <laughs>
<laughs> Next, I'd like to bring up um, the deputy speaker, Diana Ayala. We deserve credit for church because we're all going to get in trouble. Amen. We're all going to get in trouble. But thank you to the reporters that actually made it out here today because I think that this is a really important subject matter. And I wish there were more of you here today because um, it's that important that we should all be at the table. And so thank you for being here. I think that when you're looking at the face of homelessness, this is it. Right? Mm -hmm. Shams is it? Mm -hmm. I am the face of homelessness. Mm -hmm. uh, the first time I was homeless, I was five. Uh, there was a fire in my building. I lived in the Lower East Side. Mm -hmm. uh, I started as part of a domestic dispute that left my family and many others in my building homeless, mm -hmm. including other family members. Uh, we benefited from the tier two shelter setting um, and were, you know, uh, transitioned over to public housing just across the street. Second time I was homeless, I was 17 years old. I had a son whose father had been murdered. Um, I was struggling. And and I emancipated myself and ended up in shelter just not too far from here at Catherine Street in a congregate setting. Um, it's very dehumanizing. It's very scary. I remember I cried the whole first two days that I was there. And people kept asking me, why are you crying? And I'm like, why wouldn't I? Why wouldn't I cry? Like, this is not where I envisioned myself. Um, I think I deserve better than this. I have, and I've shared this story many times, of my brother who suffers from serious mental illness, who has been in and out of uh, incarceration since he was 11 years old. He spent a lot of time in uh, what we call solitary confinement, I call it the box, and that obviously you know, uh, made his condition worse. He can no longer um, live in a congregate setting, and he has to live in a shelter because obviously he's not employed, he, can't, he's not empl he doesn't have employable skills, um, and he uh, oftentimes is off medication. Our systems are really broken, and I don't think that people really understand that. I, you know, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a sibling of a person with mental illness, I struggle. As an elected official, as a deputy speaker of this body, I struggle getting services for my brother because my brother is an adult and my brother technically can make decisions on his own. And so oftentimes my brother is one of the people that is sleeping in the trains. And oftentimes my brother is sleeping in the park because he does not feel safe sleeping in a congregate shutting, a setting. And that's because his mental illness, right? I want to, sometimes I want to strangle him, I'll be honest about that. Mm -hmm. He is annoying as heck, mm -hmm. you know? He can become a handful. And in that type of setting, it's very difficult to manage that. And so I, you know, I, I just want to say that we're on the same page um, in regards to, you know, to, to how we get to a place where people are in a, in a, in a, in a housing, uh, you know, environment that they feel uh, safe in, where they're receiving the services that they receive. And I'll further share that when I came into office, uh, many of you know 125th Street and um, and I've spent, and Eddie, you know, uh, who's my neighboring assembly member knows, eight years I've been working on 125th Street. I have a lot of gray hair under this to die. Uh, that, and when I die, I, you know, I, on the record, I want 125th Street named after me. <laughs> um, but I remember going there and in the height of the synthetic marijuana, and we did a lot of work to clean up a lot of the conditions there. But then after we did that, about 80% of the population disappeared in a very small uh, percentage stood behind and we wondered well what these are the people that need the most intensive you know care um, and so I, I said well how are we gonna treat them and they said well we can't we weren't doing nothing and I'm, I said what do you mean we're doing nothing well we can't force them to go into a shelter and we can't force them to go into a mental health facility and we can't force them to seek substance use disorder you know services so and it's a public street they're not breaking the law so as long as they're not doing anything we can't do anything they'll live there and you know that's it and I said that's, what that's ridiculous that is inhumane. Yeah. It is the equivalent of leaving a child out on the street many That's times. Right. Come on. It is inhumane. And I've lost, I mean, obviously throughout the years, many of these people have become friends. I know them by name, and they have died on the street. They have died because they've been exposed yes. to harsh weather. They have died because they have been sick and they had no idea that they were sick because they hadn't seen a primary doctor in years. So safe haven beds, stabilized beds, drop-in centers, they work. We know that they work. This is a meaningful investment. I am really excited to be here today, and I want to thank the mayor because I do agree that we cannot simply walk by and do nothing. And so this is a humongous, uh, you know, a step forward. And I thank all of the colleagues because this, you know, I'm sure everybody here plays a role in this. So thank you all. And and um, I look forward to uh, budgets handshake. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you so much, Deputy Speaker. It just reminds me the importance of stories right. and how stories can help you really see the issues in ways sometimes we don't want to get that close to them. So thank you so much for sharing that. Next speaker will be Assemblyman Eddie Gibbs. <laughs> how you doing? Do I need to get on post? No, you're good, good. Good morning, everybody. Um, I changed my mind. I put in the request to have a 125th Street named after me <laughs> when I leave this earth. But um, <clears throat> my deputy speaker can have whatever she wants. In fact, you can have a 116th Street, too. <laughs> it was the legendary Mahatma Gandhi who once said the true measures of any society could be found in how it treats its most vulnerable members. Often I'm reminded of this quote when I encounter people experiencing homelessness in our city. We all have an obligation to care for, serve, and to ultimately protect every New Yorker. People experiencing homelessness are certainly no exception. I applaud uh, this historic, and I'm saying that word again, historic uh, investment in resources and services uh, to the hopeless, vulnerable population. And I know politicians like to throw around the word often historic. But guys, we're talking about $171 million. When we are talking about $171 million that's going to help this vulnerable population, I cannot help but say the word historic, because this truly matters. This is the largest investment of this nature made by any city administration ever, and a critical step in our ongoing mission to turn New York around and make it the more equitable city that we all deserve. So, Mr. Mayor, I want to thank you for this game changer in addressing homelessness in our New York. Uh, I was trying to get to the Yankee game yesterday <laughs> to get you a baseball bat because I wanted to present it to you today so you could continue to knock it out the park. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. But we know what happened in Cleveland, so I can't do it, but I thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, guys. I'm very good, Eddie. I am proud to be a New Yorker every day, but there's something about this moment that I think I'm going to remember for a long time. So thank you, Assemblyman. Next we have Councilmember Gail Brewer. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor, former Borough President. And I am honored to be here today for a couple of reasons. It, first of all, you put together a great team to talk about housing. Um, and that is half of the solution. The other half is knowing what to do. And I want to be really clear from the Olivieri Center, which has been around since Council Member Tony Olivieri and his family decided to name it after them, drop-in center, to recently touring an extraordinary safe haven run by CUCS on 14th Street, to supporting what I know uh, Julie Menon I think feels the same way, East 91st Street, got a Riverside building, a safe haven, to my understanding, CUCS considering another safe haven. I already have several on the Upper West Side. That's what we need. We need stabilization beds and we need safe havens. Um, then, as time goes on, people, as the mayor indicated, come off the street and then they end up pushing, we all push with them, for affordable housing. We do need to get either the Kavanaugh bill or Carlina Rivera's bill to change the DOB so that we can go from, on the hotel, so we can go from hotel to rent stabilization. I don't understand why the hell we need this law, but we do. Mm -hmm. So the issue for me is this is absolutely the right way to go. We've all been talking about it for decades. Um, the quality of the safe havens is extraordinary. I hope that people tour them and see. You end up with your own room, you end up with support services, you end up with maybe 18 months and then you go directly to permanent supportive housing if that's appropriate. So this 171 million is doing the right thing. Um, we just make the, need to make sure that we find sites and I wanted to ca agree with what the mayor said. Everybody has to take their share. They have to understand that when you have a quality 
nonprofit. I'm very picky about my nonprofits. Right. <laughs> but when you have a quality nonprofit building a safe haven or stabiliz stabilization beds, it's an asset to your community. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Ambrua, and thank you for your longtime support of this issue. Another person who has been at the um, forefront of this issue for a long time, Council Member Julie Menon. Thank you so much, Deputy Mayor. I cannot tell you how honored I am to be here today for this game changer of an announcement. And it is a game changer because we all know the crisis that is going on in our city. For so many of our neighbors who've lost their job or they might have mental health issues or substance abuse problems and now are experiencing homelessness. I want to thank the mayor for this incredible investment of $171 million so that 4,000 New Yorkers who are experiencing homelessness will now have a bed, will now have um, housing, will now have the kind of services that they need, mental health counseling, placement for jobs. This is so vital. As Gail Brewer mentioned, we are building a safe haven in my district on East 91st Street. It is an 88-bed facility. We are incredibly proud of that. And yes, every community needs to make sure that they are stepping up and doing the same. So thank you, Mr. Mayor, for doing this, and thank you to the administration. Morning, Mr. Mayor. How's it going? You seven uh, days a week like me, you know that. Stuff done too. <laughs> uh, a lot of folks here referencing how difficult the fight often is to select a location convince the community that this is an asset, as, as Councilmember Brewer said. How do you avoid fights like what we're seeing in Chinatown, like what we saw with the Lucerne on the west side? How do you kind of message that and, and see this to fruition? Uh, great question. And what we are doing, information is key. Uh, Commissioner Jenkins is, we're going to put in place a, a GIS mapping. So when we sit down and speak with our council persons, we can show them um, where their colleagues have beds, um, how many beds they have in their area. And so when we go to community boards, it shouldn't be that we're trying to dump into your community. We believe the city has failed to do a real visual analysis of here are the beds. And then as partners, say, um, where would you like to bed in your councilmatic district? Uh, I know that for, in particular, um, Bob Holden attempted to say that instead of putting the bed in this location, can we put it in this location? No, one's, no one um, was willing to listen to him. We don't want to do that. We want a partnership with our council uh, persons and say, here's the beds across the city. If there are 10 in uh, one district and there's two in your district, we need your help in placing the beds in your district. So it's about information. We don't want to force feed. We want a partnership to get it right. Mr. Mayor, uh, over the last few weeks, we've seen a bit of a revolving door. Uh, we've had folks who put up encampments, refuse to leave the encampments, then get arrested, then come back two weeks later. You know, the same thing happened over and over again. Arrest, counts being uh, built. Is this investment, do you think it could help stop this revolving door of arrest and these encampments keep getting built? Yes, without a doubt. And remember, as we stated, we're building trust. So when you have 10 people that uh, you say we're no longer living on the street like this, and uh, two of the 10 decide, well, I'm going to find another location, sometimes we miss the eight. The eight that have made the decision Either they're going to go back home, uh, they're going to take us up on our safe havens, uh, they're going to find other ways to uh, you know, make sure they have the proper housing, and then we're going to go back to the two, we're going to continue to build trust. We have an amazing group of people who are on the street every day building that trust. That trust is part of the problem that we're finding. When I spoke with the woman uh, last week, uh, she just did not have trust. She didn't believe anyone cared. Uh, you, we have to do the one-on-one -on -one hard work of sitting down and having those conversations. And that's what the teams are doing at the end of the line. That's what they're doing on the streets. Uh, we are showing the compassion, the caring, and we have to rebuild the trust until we can get those two that state they are going to come and go back out. That's the goal. You want to say something? Ooh, I heard somebody over. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. I, w I just want to say, um, to, to answer your question, uh, forgive me, pardon me. Okay, brother. But I think one of the things that um, 
is very important is the, the in, in the Lucerne situation was the fact of community engagement. And I think in the previous administration, there was not enough community engagement prior to bringing homeless New Yorkers or, or, or even supportive housing into certain communities. And I think the difference now is that there's more of a, of, of a desire to reach out to communities on all sides of the table and respect the differing views and be able to engage in order to uh, show the, the value that, say, for instance, a safe haven, a stabilization bed presents to each community. And so even in a place like Chinatown, I know that there's serious engagement within the community to show them that there is value in having those type of uh, so-called facilities in, in, those, in those places. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I think we'll move to yep, yep. Okay, folks. Thank you. 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 Thank you.